Hi, I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast for June 2019. Today we're going to be looking at the beautiful but surprisingly merciless story that many of us know as Sleeping Beauty. Once upon a time, there were a king and a queen who wanted to have a child, but had no child. Every day the sun would rise and the world would seem all fresh and new again, and they would think to themselves, oh, how we wish we had a child. But still, there was no child in their lives. But one day, the queen was bathing in a pool in the palace garden, when a frog hopped out of that pool and began to speak. And the frog said, O oh, my queen, have no fear. You shall have a child within a year. And the frog hopped away. Well, it turned out that what the frog said was true. Within a year, the queen gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. A beautiful baby girl. And the king and the queen were so happy, so happy, they decided to have a great party, a great feast. They decided to invite all their friends and family to a great feast at their castle. So the invitations went out, and they invited everybody they knew. They also invited the thirteen wise women of that kingdom. Now these wise women were strong, formidable, powerful ladies. There were many stories about them. They were very mysterious. People told stories. They said that some of them could speak to the wind, that others could know spells that would make the mushrooms grow fatter and tastier. Some said they knew the dreams of the rocks and the stones. Some said they had spells that could let them fly and change the course of events, make it rain, make the sun shine. All kinds of crazy stories were said. No one knew much about them. But they were strong and they were magical and they were mysterious. So the invitations went out to them as well. And then in the castle, the king and the queen and all their servants began to get that place ready. They began to clean that castle out. They made the banquet hall ready. Down in the kitchen, all kinds of things were happening. The cook was getting all kinds of cakes and things ready. They were preparing to roast a giant ox there. All kinds of things happening. And in the banquet hall, the king was looking over everything to make sure it was all right. And he noticed something. They had a table for the wise women, but they only had 12 golden plates. 12 plates shining just like the sun. 12 of them, but only 12. And there were 13 wise women. So he said to himself, this will never do, this can't happen. So they sent a message to the 13th wise woman. And the message was, we're sorry, you cannot come. And they left it at that. Well, the preparations went on, they got ready, and finally the big day arrived. And everyone came to that castle, and it was a beautiful sunny day. The flags on the top of the castle were blowing in the wind. And in that great banquet hall, well, the bards, they sang songs. They sang songs and told stories about the beginning of the world and the creation of all things, and about the princess who was born inside a clamshell. And there was feasting and song, and the ox was cooked, and there was cake, and oh, it was a great party. It's an amazing party. People got drunk even. They toppled around telling jokes that hadn't been told for a thousand years that were hilarious and funny and made even the potatoes split open and crackle with laughter. And then at one point, there came a moment when all the wise women began to stand up one by one and give blessings to the baby girl. And these blessings were so beautiful. The words they spoke were so mingled and woven with the air of that moment that, well, it seemed like these were actually spells that were being happening right there. They were taking place right there in that place. One wise woman gave the baby girl beauty. Another gave her wisdom and intelligence. Another gave her strength. One gave her luck. They all gave these things to the baby girl. And the eleventh wise woman had just spoken and just sat down when suddenly the door slammed open and in came the thirteenth wise woman and she was angry. She had a look on her face like storm clouds and her dress was purple and black and there was a red lightning bolt across it and she went to the middle of the room and she said, I have a gift for this child as well and my gift is this. On her fifteenth birthday, she shall prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel and fall down stone dead just like that. And she turned and she stormed out. And everyone was quiet. Everyone was quiet. And there was a feeling in the air as though ashes were falling down into that room. 
ashes perhaps from a fire burning high up on the surface of the moon. But the last, the twelfth wise woman, had not yet spoken. So she stood up, and she said, I cannot stop this spell, but I can soften it, for my gift is this. On her fifteenth birthday, this beautiful baby girl, she'll prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel and fall asleep for a hundred years. And then she sat down. And people breathed out a little bit. They felt a little bit better. But still, it was a scary event that had happened there. So people, you know, drank and ate a little bit more, and then everyone went home. But the next day, the king declared that all the spindles in that kingdom should be brought to that castle. And they piled them up there in front of the castle, and they burned them all in a huge bonfire. The ashes rose up into the sky and drifted away, carried on the wind to distant lands. Well, the king felt better after that. Many other people felt better, too. There's no spindles in this kingdom. How can she prick her finger? That'll never happen. And so the years went by, and the baby girl grew up, and she had a wonderful childhood. It was just terrific. All the gifts that the wise woman had given to her seemed to come true. She was beautiful, she was strong, she was lucky, she all kinds of things. She had a wonderful childhood, many friends, there was enough shadow and enough light in her life through those years to make her grow into a wonderful young woman. And then her fifteenth birthday came. And on this morning, it was interesting, the king and the queen, they had gone out on a trip, and they were expected back that morning. But when she awoke, the princess was more or less alone in that place. There were servants around that place, of course, but she was more alone in that castle than she had ever been. And she was curious. She began to explore. She went down hallways. That castle was a big place. She went down hallways and corridors she'd never been before. She opened doors she'd never dared to open before, and she found all kinds of things. She found a room filled with maps, maps of the other world, of the future world, of the past, all kinds of amazing atlases and things in there. She found a room filled with ropes, the rope room. She found a room filled with chocolate. She explored that whole castle. Finally, she came to a tower, and she found herself walking up a spiraling stair. Up and up she went, until finally she came to a door at the top of that staircase. And there was a lock on that door, and there was a rusty key in that lock. And she reached out to touch that key, and all she did was barely touch it with her fingers when it sprang open, and the door swung open. And she looked into that tower, and she saw a beautiful thing. She saw a golden bed covered in a quilt, and this quilt had stories stitched into it. There was a picture there of a turtle with a young woman on it. There was a picture of gods up in the sky. There was a picture of a fox swimming across a lake with a chicken in its mouth. And beside the bed was a spinning wheel, and there was an old woman there working at that spinning wheel. Hello, Granny, said the princess. What are you doing there? Oh, my child, come in, come in, look. Yes, I am spinning. This is a spinning wheel, you see. I am taking the wool, and I am spinning it into yarn. Oh, my dear, how does this work, said the princess. Oh, just like this. Look, here's the treadle on the floor. This is this. This is the wheel itself. You can see how it turns. Tokata, wokata, tokata, wokata. It turns like that. See, this is the wool, and this is the yarn I'm making. Oh, and here, this is the spindle. Would you like to touch the spindle? Yes, please. So the princess reached out and held the spindle. As she took hold of it, it pricked her finger. And she looked down, and she saw one drop of luminous, beautiful blood and that was the last thing she saw for a long time. For her eyes fluttered shut like the wings of butterflies, and she fell down into the bed and into a deep sleep. Now the thing about her sleep was it was not just her sleep, but it spread out to fill the entire castle. For no sooner had she fallen asleep in that bed than the old woman there began to nod, and she fell asleep. And the spinning wheel slowed to a stop. Talkata, walkata, talkata, walkata. Downstairs in the entryway of the castle, the princess's parents, the king and the queen, they had just come in the door. They were there dressed in their fine, resplendent clothes, but they slumped to the floor and fell asleep. There was a girl there with some white towels for them to wash their faces from the dust of their journey, and she was reaching out to offer them to the king and the queen, and she fell asleep, and the white towels were strewn on the marble floor. 
There was a boy there with a bowl of water to help them wash their faces, and he just had time to set that bowl down when he too slumped into a heap on that floor and slept. Down in the kitchen, downstairs in the basement, all kinds of things were going on. The servant boy had just dropped a bowl of soup, and the cook was about to slap him. Oh, you dumb serving boy! Ah! But just like that, in mid-slap, the cook fell asleep, and the serving boy fell asleep beside the spilled soup. And the crackling of the fire in the hearth there, it came to a stop, and the fire stopped, and it slept. It stopped. And the flies buzzing in that kitchen, they fell asleep all at once on the wall. Just like that. Outside in the royal stables, there were horses out there, but they neighed once, and they fell asleep. And the doves on the roof of the castle, they tucked their heads under their wings, and they fell asleep. And the flags at the top of the castle, they stopped fluttering in the wind. And out there in the royal apple orchard, the wind was moving the boughs and branches of those trees up and down. But then it too stopped, and everything was still. So nothing moved in that whole castle. Everything fell into a deep sleep. And this sleep went on all day and all night. It went on for weeks, months. It went on for an entire year, and then another year. And the only thing that changed in this place, the only thing that altered in any way, was a small little rose bush that was growing beside the gate of that castle. All through that first summer it grew while everything else slept. And then it slept through the winter, and the following summer the rose bush grew some more. Year by year that rose bush grew. After ten years that rose bush had climbed up the wall of the castle and started to go across the moat. After twenty years, it had crossed the moat and climbed all the way to the top of the castle wall there and was going inside the castle over the roofs of it. After thirty years, that rose bush was so big it had engulfed that entire castle and climbed over the towers of that castle as well. Forty years went by, fifty years, the rhythm of our lives, summer, winter, fall, spring, all these seasons dancing together, moving in a circle, to the wheel of the year, turning on its axle of silence and eternity. So the seasons went forward, and the rose bush grew through all of this time. Soon it was gigantic. Soon the rose bush had swallowed the entire castle. People walking by, they would see in the distance this great hill of a rose bush. And they would hear the buzzing and humming of the bees as they visited all those flowers. But they would see no castle. Fifty years, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety years went by. During this time, young men, brave young men on strong horses with sharp swords, well, they'd heard the story about the princess possibly asleep inside what possibly might be a castle inside that rose bush, and they tried to get their way in there. They tried to slash and cut their way through that rose bush, but they failed. All of them failed. The rose bush had a way of entangling them. As they moved forward, it would grow around them, even as they walked there, and soon many of them died in that place. And the rose bush grew around the bones of those young men and the bones of their horses. Finally, this spell went on, and it was almost time for this spell to be finished. In fact, it was the day before this spell would be done forever, and it would begin to unravel. And on this day, a young man came into that kingdom. A young man much like all the others. He had a good strong horse, he had a sharp sword. He came into that kingdom looking for something dangerous to do, looking for mysterious places to go, risky things to accomplish in that place. And he found an inn in that kingdom, and he spent the night there. And that evening he was sitting by the crackling fire there, and there was an old man in that inn who was known for telling stories. And every night he would tell long stories about the acorn that grew the universe out of itself, and the angel with brown wings who played the banjo on the roof of old McAllister's barn over there, and about the green horse who died in that field but could be heard, the galloping of the hooves of this horse could be heard every night in November as it galloped through the fields a ghost horse. And the old man told the story about the princess asleep in the castle inside the rose bush. Well, there might be a castle there, no one knows, but that's the story, he said. And when he said this story, this story was like a seed, and a flower grew from this seed. It was like a spark, and a great fire blossomed out of that spark inside the chest of that prince. He heard that story, and he said, ah, 
That is the quest for me. That is the dangerous thing I want to do. So the next day, he got on his good horse. He saddled it up. He got his strong, sharp sword, and he headed out for that rose bush. He approached it, that giant, mountainous rose bush. Now it was all in blossom. There were bees all humming and buzzing around that rose bush. The roses were of many different colors. The smell was outrageously amazing. It was a wind come from far off, telling only of good, sweet things, perhaps. But there were shadows in that rose bush as well. He looked inside. Perhaps he could see the bones in there and the dark places of that rose bush that held and clenched young men and killed them. And he went to that rose bush and he raised his sharp sword as he was about to cut through it. But an amazing thing happened. The rose bush opened of itself. The branches and the flowers spread to the side, and he was able, on his horse, to trot into that rose bush. He kept going. Carefully they went forward, and the rose bush parted before them, just like that, moving aside. Forward they went, down this sort of tunnel in the rose bush itself. Finally they looked ahead, and they saw. What did they see? Oh, it was a stone? What is that? A garden wall? No, wait a minute. That's a castle. There is a castle in here, he thought to himself. And he went to that castle wall, and he tied up his horse to one of the branches of the rose bush, and he began to climb that rose bush. It was hard going. There were giant thorns on this thing. They were almost a hundred years old. He climbed up the side. His hands were bleeding from climbing up there, but he climbed up the wall of that castle, over the top of the wall, and down inside. Soon he found himself in the entryway of that castle. And he saw them there. He saw the king and the queen dressed in their resplendent clothes, asleep on the floor, the crown falling just off the king's head. He saw the young boy there asleep on the floor beside his bowl of water. He saw the young girl asleep there beside the towels strewn on the marble stones. Then he went down to the kitchen. He explored that castle in the same way the princess had so many years before. And he found himself in that kitchen, and there was the cook, asleep with a snarl on his face. There was a serving boy, asleep with a bowl of soup spilled on the floor beside him. There was the fire, asleep in the hearth. There were the flies, asleep on the wall. He went out to the royal stable. He saw the horses asleep there. He looked up at the top of the castle. He saw the doves asleep on the roof, how the flag was not moving at all. He went out to the apple orchard. And he saw how the branches of those trees were completely still. And then he found his way to a spiraling stair in a tower of that castle. And he began to walk up that spiraling stair. Up and up he went, up those stairs. Finally he came to a door, a door that was ajar. It had a rusty key in it, and the door was open. And he looked into that room. And there he saw the golden bed with the stories on its quilt. He saw the princess asleep on that bed, and the old woman at her spinning wheel asleep beside the bed. And then he walked. Without thinking, he walked into that room. He bent down, and he kissed the princess on her cheek. And her eyes fluttered open like the wings of butterflies, and she looked at the prince, and she smiled. Now downstairs in the entryway of the castle, the king and the queen, well, they awoke as well. The king put the crown on his head, he stood up, and the young boy, well, he awoke, he took the bowl of water and he held it out to them. He said, welcome home, my dear king and queen, here is some water, please wash the dust from your journey off of your faces. And the serving girl did the same thing. She awoke, she gathered up those towels, and she said, yes, yes, king and queen, here are these towels, please wash your faces, you've had a long journey. Down in the kitchen. Well, everything started moving down there. The cook awoke. He awoke with that snarl, and he said, You dumb serving boy! And he slapped him just like that. Ow! said the serving boy. And then the fire began to crackle and burn in the hearth, and the flies, they all awoke at the same time, bzzzed, and began buzzing around that kitchen. Out there in the stable, the horses awoke, and they shook themselves, and they looked around with their big, large, horsey eyes. And on the roof of that castle, the doves awoke and they flew away. And out in the apple orchard, the boughs of the trees began to stir and whisper and move up and down. And then, down those spiraling stairs from that tower, came the princess and the prince, hand in hand, and they came down into the entryway of that castle, and they said, Welcome home, mother and father, welcome home, my king and queen. And there was much rejoicing there. They were glad to see each other again. 
and the prince, well, he spent some time in that castle. He spent a while getting to know the princess there. And after a while, it was decided that they would be married. So there was a wedding. The magical words were said, knitting the two of them together, threading together their two families. And then there was a great feast afterwards. The bells were rung, the gongs were played, the harps were played, and all kinds of celebrating happened. The kitchen made all kinds of food. They roasted an ox yet again. There was cake, there was wine, amazing blue wine they brought up from the basement of that castle. There were bards singing long stories about the creation of the world and the end of the world and the adventures of all the people in that world. It was a beautiful moment, a beautiful party. And the king and the queen invited all 13 wise women of that kingdom and all of them came. And well, I was at that party as well, and I was given a golden key, and I was told if I rub this key, I will be able to become invisible any time I want to. But on the way here, something happened on the train in the Detroit airport, in the Bristol train station, I don't know, somewhere along the line, something went wrong, and that key was stolen or lost or it fell out of my luggage, because I can't find it anywhere right now. And it would be nice to have, because sometimes it is helpful to be able to become invisible. But I will have to do without it. So all I have for you is this story. Thank you for listening to this story. May it feed and nourish you. May it be a seed blossoming in your life. May you water it with your attention. And may there be great flowers rising up and singing out of this story, perhaps, in all of our futures. Thank you for listening to this story. A story can be like a river, like a stream, and maybe somewhere there's a great ocean of story, and every story is a wave on that ocean. So we don't want to dam up the river of this story. We don't want to channel it. We don't want to put it into a concrete box to flow through our cities. But if we want to relate to this story, to connect with it, to hear what it has to say, one way to do that is to let it wash over you, to remember all the images of this story, some of which are very old. So I invite you to find a place in this story that grabs you, that annoys you, that delights you. A part of this story that buzzes for you. I invite you to remember this story with the eyes of your heart. Or to perhaps you can think of this story as a landscape. And perhaps there is a place in this landscape where it feels best for you to sit down. I invite you to do that. Thank you for joining me here. So I encourage you to 
pause to take a minute and reflect on this story in your own way in whatever way seems right to you um turn me off you know pause this podcast if you want whatever you know um because your own reactions to this story your own feelings about it will tell you a lot um so i encourage you to do that but uh, after you've done that uh here's some thoughts from me uh because i've told this story a bunch and i guess here's my journey through this story um, basically not long after i started telling this story something about it began to bug me and that's a good sign that's a good sign do we want stories that we completely agree with that tell us things we already know that completely comfort us no we want something to wrestle with something to disagree with and that's often a good way into a story if you ever have that experience uh, for me it was the end of the story and i found i had misremembered it in fact because uh, of the end we get of the curse we've got the hundred years of sleep for the princess we get the rose bush and then this prince shows up and he walks into the kingdom and he it was who bugged me because i wanted him to do something heroic this is a fairy tale for gosh sakes you know i want him to kill a dragon or at least fight his way into that rose bush come on man do something but no he just shows up and walks in to that castle and into the princess's life so I totally agree that we don't need to go around killing dragons all the time uh, and violence isn't always the way, you know, but I just wanted him to be active in some way in this story. And the story says he basically is not. He just shows up and there he is. So one way to react to this or at any time this comes up in a story for you is to turn the story off, is to disregard it and say, well, it's just wrong or I just don't like it. It's not my kind of thing. Um, and you could, you know, just say that and close the book. You could also look for a different version of this story because there are many. Uh, this particular one is from the Grimm brothers. Uh, they heard it from a woman named Marie Hassenflug. The Hassenflug family uh, were of French descent. They spoke French at home, and they had three daughters, and the Grimm brothers were friends with this family. And often they would go there and uh, listen to stories. Uh, so just hold that in your head for a minute, these two young German guys going to this other family's house. Marie Hassenflug was probably about 24 years old, and she told this story. Uh, we don't know where she heard it from. Uh, there is a version in Charles Perrault. Uh, he's a fellow who did a bunch of uh, French story tales, a great edition of French folk tales, um, that is somewhat similar to this, but somewhere along the line it was changed, either by the Grimm brothers or by Marie, perhaps, or whoever she heard it from. So that's the moment when this story enters written culture, and a lot follows from it, of course. Um, so anyway, that's the version we're dealing with here. The version told by Marie Hassenflug to the Grimm brothers and written down in their uh, collection. So you could look around, you could find a version that you like better. But the other thing to do is to accept this story on its own terms and say this is the way it was told on a particular day in a particular place and entertain the possibility that there is a truth there in the way it was told. And then you can choose to wrestle with it. So doing that, uh, you look at that prince who doesn't do much, and it's like, well, what does he do? He shows up at the right time. That's all he does is show up at the right time. So maybe time is something this story is trying to teach us about. Maybe that is part of its message. Um, all these other suitors come, all these other guys try to get into that place, and they fail. They end up as bones in the rose bush, which is an image I just love totally. Um, but he shows up at the right time after the hundred years have passed and there he is so maybe time is crucial to the story it's crucial to the healing of this curse which has happened certainly so that led me back to thinking about the uh the main event you know the when it all starts which is that party there they have the kid the king and queen and then they have a party they invite all their friends and there's the king setting out the plates in the banquet hall or inspecting them perhaps and he sees they're all golden plates and there's 12 of them and there's 13 wise women and something about that is suspicious you might say is interesting is intriguing okay 12 golden plates just think about that and set out by the king 
and then 13 wise women. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be going too far to say and to feel what's happening in that situation. We've got the king. We've got this solar sun energy. The sun is often connected with uh, the male side of things in our culture. There he is. He's laying them out. And then we've got the 13 wise women. There's often 13 full moons in any given year. Um, so again, it seems to me we've got this interplay of the masculine and the feminine energies there. And the king is doing what a king does. The wise women don't fit his plan. There's 12 plates. We can't have 13 wise women. And on his terms, he's completely right. Uh, we've only got 12 plates. What are we going to do? So this story, uh, that's where this all starts, right? He makes that mistake. Well, let's not call it a mistake. He takes that action of shutting out the 13th wise women, which brings down the curse on their heads in which they must wait. So his impatience, his intolerance with the feminine side of life, with the natural order, the feminine in the natural order as well. This isn't just women in particular. This is the feminine in men and women. And as it is expressed through all of the cosmos, through all kinds of things out there, through gender, through shadows, through darkness, through sleep. If you remember the I Ching, the Chinese book of divination, you know, it divides the cosmos into yang and yin pretty much. Or it explains that there are these two energies in the world, yang and yin. Uh, yin is a feminine, it is the dark side of a hill, they say. Um, so all those parts of life, uh, which uh, include women, but go beyond them, and they go beyond gender, which require uh, silence, which require, you know, sleep, require waiting, um, which are shady and dark. All these energies are the ones the king is shutting out, basically. He's like, 12 golden plates, that's it. Tell her she can't come. And then we get the curse. So the whole story is a healing of that moment, really, and of his intolerance for that, for that side of things. So I love that about this story. And, you know, it I feels to me like something that is there. If you look at the French version, the name of Sleeping Beauty herself is Aurora, which means dawn. So it does seem like there's something celestial in this story, something about the larger order, the sun and the moon. Of course, the solar calendar and the lunar calendar don't coincide so well. That's why we have a leap year every four years. That's why the Mayans made this complicated uh, structure of calendars that they use to reconcile those two things. So that's something we live with as humans on this planet, as beings, as animals on this planet. And this story uh, deals with it in this way. So as far as the prince is concerned in this story, and the princess, and the love between them, this story is a bit harsh, it seems to me. For it doesn't speak about a love of the soul, about finding your true soul mate in the world. That's a tradition we get from a lot of sources, but among them the poetry of the Middle East, of Persia, the love poetry there, which came through the troubadours to Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, it led to the love poetry of Petrarch, which led to the sonnets of Shakespeare, which led to Romeo and Juliet, among other things. It leads to the rock and roll songs we hear on the radio. It leads to the Kowali songs he heard in Pakistan and sung in Urdu and things like that. Uh, this tradition of finding your soul mate and love as a path to the soul, as a way to know another person deeply and to be connected in that, that beautiful way. And this story uh, some pretty much disregards that, really. Um, as fairy tales do, it's pretty merciless and just says this guy came at the right time. Perhaps all those other fellows who tried to get into that rose bush and ended up in there dead, uh, perhaps they would have been fine too. But it's just this guy came along at the right time, and so he was the right one for the princess. So you can think about the beautiful disaster, which is teenage romance and of dating and all those nervous, uncomfortable years and guys in their used cars and rock and roll and the prom and the dance, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, or maybe you don't want to think about it. I, mean, I don't really want to think about it. But um, and then you think about these poor guys trying to get into that rose bush, and ending up as bones in the, in the rose bush there. And then the prince who finally arrives and it just parts for him at the right time. The rose bush filled with flowers, filled with the humming and the buzzing of bees. And of course, there's a beautiful image of the rose bush itself, which grows and not, you know, it grows extravagantly in the end, but it just grows steadily in a daily way. And it is beautiful. It's got the flowers. It's also got the thorns. 
And that's the whole story right there, perhaps, the slow, persistent, beautiful growing of that rose bush. Another way to look at story is to ask yourself what problem uh, made this story necessary? What error or uh, crisis in a community uh, led to this story? A story is like a dream, so why did the, a particular culture dream this dream? What was this story intended to solve? What problem is it that it is medicine for? And perhaps that problem is uh, you know, a shutting out of the the cycle of the moon, a shutting out of the the moon side of things, the lunar nature of the world, uh, the more feminine side of the cosmos, um, and an insistence on our our boxes, our human definitions, our terms. You know, it's got to fit in the box. How often have have I done that? Have all of us done that? Something doesn't fit, and we disregard it. We shut it out. And this story says there is a penalty for that. And it's going to be paid uh, by you, but very more specifically, it's going to be paid by your children, which is also kind of a heavy thing to wrestle with in this story. So that is simply my walk through the landscape of this story. Your journey through the story might be entirely different. And I encourage you to take that journey and to let this soak into your your life, this story, into your bones and your body, and um, and turn me off. Shut this podcast down and just live with this story for a little bit. You could even take a walk. Take a walk and think of this story and find the places where it happened. Stories are often placed in the land by cultures. Find out where that inn is, where that old man is telling stories. Find out where that rose bush is. Find out where that castle is or was. Find out where the 13 wise women hang out for you in your world. Are they in a city? Are they in the forest? Are they in the corner? Where are those ladies? So thank you for listening to this podcast. If you're able to support this podcast by becoming a member, please do so. It's a way to support the work of getting these stories out into the world. These stories which are maps, which are medicine, which are wild animals that have a lot to teach us. Thanks very much. All the best.